Hey, everybody, and welcome to Cars with Cocktails, a show where we join two things that go perfectly together, drinking and driving. I'm your host, Paul Barrett, joined by my co-host, Charles, a.k.a. the Hum Mechanic. Hum Mechanic? That's good. Hum I like that. Also, um, uh, I, am, I am not driving, but I will be drinking. And yes. We, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I'm going to take responsibility for the lack of creativity on my end with my drink because it is... Uh, the same thing we had last week, a gin and tonic. Uh, I have no excuse other than, eh, whatever. <laughs> Is that a candy cane straw? Uh, more, well, yeah, kind of more of a barber shop. <laughs> we, uh, you know, okay. we have we have a plethora of different colored straws. This one matches. It was totally accidental. Uh, I just try to get the one that my daughter hasn't chewed on the end of, if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, because this is a choose your own adventure drink, I'm revisiting a drink that uh, Max and I tried, or not even a drink, a, a liquor, which would be peanut butter whiskey. Oh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear about that. So we tried previously peanut butter old fashions, which were basically peanut butter whiskey and regular whiskey mixed together. Uh, we both fucking hated them. They were terrible. It sounds uh, pretty awful. <laughs> uh, today, I'm uh, doing a uh, whiskey soda with this. So this is with our Schweppes from last week. Schweppes. Uh, with, with some screwball whiskey. So I actually haven't tried it yet. Oh, I'm, I'm waiting. I actually, I actually like it. It's actually all right. So what what is it about that versus the uh, the last one um, that makes it good versus horrible? okay? Wait, wait, what did you say? Fucking terrible! I think yeah, <laughs> fucking terrible. <laughs> so I am not generally a brown liquor drinker, right? So you get whiskeys kind of. I would describe it as a harsh taste, right? It kind of goes down kind of hard. I think it's a very acquired taste, like you know, like when you had beer when you were seventeen, and you're like. Yeah, you're choking Coors it down. Coors Light's disgusting. Right. And now Coors Light's disgusting. Right, yeah, different, different disgusting. Uh, and I just don't have an acquired taste for it. So the, the old fashioned was almost the worst of everything because it had like some sweetness with like peanut butter sweetness kind of with the harshness. And I think it just overall was just kind of, a gross taste. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a recipe for uh, for disaster. I I also am not a huge brown liquor uh, drinker. I had a phase at one point in my life where I drank a lot of rum and coke, and um, I feel like if I drank more than one today, I would just be like overwhelmed with sweetness. I uh, I don't uh, I don't have quite the sweetness palate. That said, I do love candy. So, you know, I've just shifted my sweetness to a different spot, I suppose. This, the reason why the peanut butter whiskey, this kind of had a lot of popularity around the time we were shooting that episode. And I was just like, let's try something interesting. You know, hey, peanut butter whiskey. Uh, I'm generally not a fan. Uh, I've heard people talk about it like they really loved it. And it's not always terrible, depending on how you, you know, consume it but as a general rule it's not my thing i wonder what other whiskey mixers you would uh you would uh, venture out with with peanut butter whiskey that's just not a, a flavor that i think of when i think of whiskey or really uh most any other alcoholic drink i don't know there's a lot of peanut butter beers that are eh, they're hit and miss i guess but uh peanut butter and peanut butter and alcohol i'm not so sure yeah, uh, uh, looking up options for this, uh, as far as cocktails, the options are usually kind of complicated. Like, they're not simple gin and tonic. It's like... <laughs> 87 it's, ingredients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and uh, most of them end up being some sort of, like, peanut butter chocolate liqueur drink that it's like, okay, like, it's it's more like a dessert than it is a drink, but... Like I could see liking it. You're not going to consume a lot of it because it probably make, make you sick. But um, yeah, so um, I'm on. I think this is actually maybe round three. I think we tried this, or maybe no, maybe during that episode, I tried peanut butter whiskey with Sprite that we just happened to have around because um, I was like, oh, I cannot have another one like this. Um, and uh, it was actually not bad with Sprite. 
I'm, I'm thinking like if you can come up with um, some sort of filling like in a pecan pie or pecan pie, depending on how you say it, uh, that could add kind of like a cool element to, uh, element to that. But short of, I think short of in food, I'm not sure that I'd be all about that. However, uh, yeah, maybe one day I'll, I'll give it a whack. Could be. Okay, so episode for today, uh, we talked about car shows. Are they dead or what is the future? Currently, right this second, they're pretty much dead. However, uh, you know, in this, in this COVID existence that we're living in, um, obviously a, a lot of things are on hold or postponed and have been for most of the year. Um, but if we had this conversation six months ago, I think my short-term opinion would be uh, that, yeah, car shows are kind of over and lame. Um, with a long-term continued, that car shows are kind of over. However, uh, I think once the world normalizes, whatever that looks like, we will see a huge boost in car shows. People missing that camaraderie of getting together over cars and um, you know, whether it's like a cars and coffee event or a true judged show or just a bunch of people hanging out with like, you know, like, uh, like-minded or like styled cars. I think we're going to see a big boom in that, but I think it's going to be pretty short lived. Yeah. You think that's going to be short lived the boom? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it doesn't have legs. Uh-uh. No, once, once it's like, all right, one or two shows under my belt and everybody realizes all those things that, they, they, they get their, they live their nostalgia of what they remember about car shows, which is usually things that are really, really great um, and have some, you know, human to human conversations, not, um, not, not digitally. Uh, I think once the honeymoon of that is done, then we go back to the trend that we've really been on for, boy, I would say at least the last five or six years now. Which, which for, for the regular audience, what, what do you consider that to be? Uh, just the, the steep, steep decline, steep decline of the car show. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, I have my own personal reasons that are, um, you know, obviously my own personal reasons, but I think we've, we've got to this point where you see all that really rad stuff on demand. Oh, you know, I want to see cool guy 47's twin turbo build. Look, boop, there's the Instagram feed Mm -hmm. with a thousand pictures on it. Uh, You don't have to worry about them not updating their forum post because it's almost like a live update all the time. Just following them on on any social media platform. Exactly. Yeah, low low effort. I, I mean, I kind of agree. I think that's partially, but I actually think to me, the biggest difference uh in car show stuff is actually due to the fragmentation of communities due to uh low effort connection because you know so obviously i'm from new jersey uh in the vw and audi world Waterfest was always a big show it has been forever um used to be insanely enormous it's still i think the biggest on the east coast but by comparison to what it once was it's a fraction of what it was. Um, but back in those days, a couple things would happen. One, you would have people who would travel from far away because they didn't know their local, whatever, Pennsylvania, you know, Pittsburgh suburb, other car enthusiasts to know how to connect with them easily. Or even if you did know them, you weren't able to easily organize a group of people without something like Facebook groups and events and that type of stuff to make it a kind of a low effort ability to connect with those people. And that to me is probably the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest reason. Now the other, the other piece of that is, is that back in those days, because it was, uh, I would, I don't want to say pre-internet, but pre-mainstream internet, it was, you would, people would go to shows with a, a lot of money with the intention of just blowing all of that money at the show. And when that shifted away, now it's people buy to go to the show so that 
and and that shows there's really not a lot of commerce going on. So it's kind of a is a weird scenario that's happening where it's it's used to be a cyclical thing, but now the people who necessarily would have a vested in, interest in the commerce of the show are now no longer promoting the show in addition to just the other pieces of it all fragmenting apart along with it. Well, and you've experienced that firsthand being a vendor at a show and, um, you know, having, you, you sell stuff, right? Little stuff here and there, but you don't have that dude that's doing their full stage to build buying stuff from, from the vendors at Waterfest. And I think part of that too is like, you can just get it on demand. Now you don't have to wait two weeks. It's like, <clears throat> right. I want it. Here it is. Send it to my house in two days. Um, and I, I think that's awesome because I might yeah. not be able to go to New Jersey to see vendor X, Y, Z and, and get their really cool discount. I can just order it online on their spring sale or, or whatever. Um, and I, I think that's really cool that, that we can do that today. It is interesting though, that it makes it from a vendor standpoint, really not very desirable because I mean, how much does it cost to set up a booth at a show like that? Right. You know, you take the cost of a booth at a show like that. It's pickles compared to like a big national car show or God forbid you throw something like SEMA in there, right. which is just on a, on a level that I think most, most people don't really appreciate how much money it costs to have a 10 by 10 square, which in is SEMA. nothing at yeah. SEMA. Yeah, I think it's um, something like 30 grand or something like that, 20 grand. It's, and mm-hmm. that's just to get the square. Yeah. That's, yeah, not, just, that's not your personnel. That's yeah. not your display. That's not your setup. That's not travel. That's not travel for all your people. Uh, all for the hope of you're going to sell a couple, and you're not selling anything at a SEMA, but at a regular show, all for yeah. the hopes that you're going to sell a couple hundred dollars worth of stuff. Now, I do think, though, if you're a smaller time a vendor for something that's maybe unique or or really niche, even within your niche, uh, the the Euro license plate one yeah. is, is something I'm thinking of. Perfect example. Mm-hmm. I would never, I shouldn't say I ne- would never. The odds of me buying one of those online are very very low. Yeah. However, I think you know if you're walking by the booth and you see one that's real cool and the colors are cool and hey they'll make you a custom one right there. Yeah, I'll throw thirty bucks at that. That's really neat. But Short of something like that, I could probably get a better deal just holding off and buying it online. I completely agree. Yeah, those those niche things certainly are uh, probably the biggest attraction at those places for commerce, other than you know food and whatever. Um, and if anybody runs some kind of special show only deal, but it's got to be pretty unique. And 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 again, what what I saw with shows was is that a lot of the people who were previously going to the show with a lot of money to spend the money now have blown all their money before the show on stuff they were doing in preparation for the show that they're not shopping at a show at all. So um, I only think to me, that's not the biggest portion, although it creates, it creates a disincentive of vendors to then pump the show more, which then creates less eyes on the show, which then, you know, which already has an attention issue to begin with because of fragmentation about people who went to, you know, a get together every month in their local car show with all their friends. So who gives a shit about this one? Yeah, I, um, I, (laughs) I feel that. And, and they, they all kind of play on top of each other. The other thing for me, like just from a straight personal standpoint is when you go to these kind of shows, there's a certain percentage of the cars that are legit builds, you know, your Bynum builds, for example, which are just top to bottom, amazing show worthy cars. Then you have the, the large segment, <laughs> large segment of bags and wheels, um, which only gets so unique. And then everything else to me just kind of blends together and it gets kind of boring super quick. Waterfest is a really good example of that in kind of two ways. One, you at least have something else going on there. And I think they've throttled back a little bit as we've saw, you know, show numbers decline over the years. Cause they used to have the burnout contest and the autocross and the drag race and, and the show and, and the, this and the, that, and like some party at night or whatever. And they've throttled a lot of that back to 
uh, I think just the drag race it was for, for 2019, um, which is still at least something to do. Uh, and for me, that's the biggest thing about car shows is that once you walked the show in 30 minutes, right now, what do you do? You're uh, only, the only thing to do is just to hang out with your buddies, um, which is awesome. And you know, it's a little different for you and I, I guess maybe, um, but that that's, that's it. You've seen the show, you've bought your license plate. You've had a crappy hamburger that was $12, uh, and a, and a $6 water or whatever. And now you just stand around all the rest of the day and in the, in the fucking heat <laughs> in the, yeah, oh god dude it, this, this laptop that i'm talking to you on now has never been the same since since waterfest and sitting in my hot car that day um <laughs> but yeah it's to me it just loses that attraction of like let's go we hang out for a couple hours and stand around and bullshit i would rather do something and do something even with that same group of people. Let's go on a cruise. Let's go, you know, do this. Let's go do that. Uh, the cruise thing is just the, the one that I, I'm, of course, am, am mostly about. But it's just boring. Once you get, like, an hour in, it's like, okay. Yeah, I think things like um, like Wookiees are probably the future in general in terms of just it being a show that – isn't really a show in the sense that there is some formal parts of it, but most people treat it like a vacation. Um, and it, it has, doesn't have a lot of structure to it. So there isn't, there isn't a lot of forced standing around at Wookiees. Right. You don't have, you know, I'm, I'm contrasting Wookiees, my favorite, one of my favorite events of the year, probably my favorite event of the year with, um, the show in Savannah, which could really, have that same kind of appeal because you're in like Savannah. It's a cool place other than being 800,000 degrees. There's a good amount of things to do. However, because of where the show has to be held, you're, you're almost you're away from into yeah. being there and yeah. without a big to do, you know, you're, you're not really going to come and go in and out of the show because you got to drag your car out and then you got to wait in traffic, go in and out. So for me, once I'm gone, once I'm done for the day, I'm out. Right. I'm if the show was on, if the show was on River Street, which could never happen because those fucking roads are insane, <laughs> but if, if hypothetically it could happen, uh, then I think it would change the dynamic a lot because what you're saying is people would come and people would go and people come back and people, you know, you can go back and forth, and that's to me that's what happens in shows that ends up being the thing that kind of kills it is when you feel trapped at a place for an extended period of time. And like, you know, you have to go, go back to take a shit and you can't do that. And it takes fucking six hours for you to get out of the place. You know, like <laughs> you have ruined your pants by that right. time. <laughs> yeah. So on that note, like where do you think we could find a place to have sort of that Wookiees vibe? Cause Wookiees is not a car show uh, short of the sound off which is where all the VR6 or all the R32s and Golf Rs park in a baseball diamond now. Um, at least that's what it was last year. And everybody revs their engine and it's over in like 10 minutes, which completely is my level of attention span for, for that <laughs> kind of show thing. Other than that, it, you just do whatever you want and hang out, go, leave, drive, don't drive, sit around and drink beer all day, go run the tail of the dragon all day and anything in between. Um, you know, come on Friday, come on Sunday, whatever you want to do. Where do you think would be a really good place that people could have kind of that come and go stuff to do, but still get together and have this kind of car show thing happen? Well, well, I think what we should first do is not assume that everybody knows uh, what Wookiees is. So, uh, for those not if familiar, you don't know, if you don't know, <laughs> you need to know. Wookiees in the Woods is a show that was, I, I wouldn't even call it a show. It was an event that was kind of a group meeting in the area near the tail of the dragon where everybody would go there. It was formerly, it was all R32 Volkswagen R32 people, which Charles has a couple of R32s. And the reason why it's called Wookiees is because the sound that VR six engines make sounds like a Wookiee uh, from star Wars. So that event. Um, so what do we, what can we do? I mean, so Wookiees to me is very much a, that, that thing, which is like a vacation. And then there's uh, whatever 
there was the dam. What was it, what was it before? Is the dam thing and then the the sound off were the only two formal events other than the barbecue, right? So it was uh, like yeah, the sound off was at the dam. So oh, was at were, the dam. Yeah, okay, so they were, were one and the same. And then okay, they got booted for. for okay, so the time. only official events lasted um, what a total of maybe four hours, five hours, probably, and that's even high. And half of that time you're eating and drinking and whatever. So it's you know it's not really like you're committed to anything. Um, and they do the award stuff and you know raffle stuff off whatever. Um, so how do you recreate that? So to me, the only way you recreate a similar event is by finding a local area that has a good, um, God, I, you know, it's so crazy when you, when I think about it, the, one of the things that's best about Wookiees is also one of the things that's worst about Wookiees is because of the remote location, there's no cell phone service, but it creates a dynamic to where people are then forced to interact in a way that they may not otherwise do. That is true. You know, one, I'm, <laughs> that's a really good point. Because I'm, I'm thinking of the last, what was the last car thing that I did? Uh, it was an Audi of America club thing at Everything Euro. And the number of people, <laughs> and it's funny that I'm kind of poking fun at this, doing what I do, um, like live streaming or Instagram video. Obviously, I, I can't tell exactly what they're doing. You know, I kind of kind of dictates like yeah. what they're doing and the way they orient their phone. But it's like, Hey, I'm Instagram living this, you know, feed or whatever. And that's not something that could ever happen at Wookiees. Golly, mm. you can't even get a damn text message, let alone live stream on Instagram or any other social platform. Um, it was kind of the, one of the cool things too. I think about Helen that I still felt a little locked in where I was uh, at the times that I was at that show, whatever it was called, I can't remember. So, uh, so there we go. Um, I felt a little bit locked in and, but no reception or very poor reception, but at least there was like stores to go to and you could go to a restaurant and eat without having to drag your car out. Um, and I thought that was cool. I still think there's some potential for some really good events in Helen and, uh, the one last year, Alpine Volks fair, uh, or whatever they had changed it, the name to, I thought did a pretty good job of having that dynamic of short car show, two hours, two hours is done, go somewhere else. Y'all do your own meets, have right. your Corrado meet, have mm-hmm. your Harlequin meet, your Mark 7 meet or whatever, and then you're just all here together. So be with your friends and, and have that kind of kind of vacation around a car show. We didn't get to see what the, uh, I, you know, I think Helen was going to mature this year into something different or slightly different. Um, we just didn't get to see what it really ended up being. Obviously, you and I had the event that we were talking about doing, or I wouldn't say talking about doing, <laughs> planned, <laughs> yeah. planned and started that completely got the rug pulled down from under us. But um, the uh, it would have been something slightly different. I don't think it would have been drastically different but it wouldn't have been the same thing that it was last year and if only for the reason that was never intended to be what it was in in, in the first place right it was it never wanted to be so oh which was just oh my god that last year was just such a shit show <laughs> and i left before it got wild so you know and that's that's another turnoff too i think when you see these shows graduate to that level of chaos the last year or so, uh, whatever the hell goes on at H2O, which I think is now uh, so, and has been for a number of years so far outside of the VW Audi community, uh, it's just a giant train wreck. You get a lot of people that don't want to go, like, I don't want to go and be involved in that stuff. No way in hell I'm bringing my family to anything like that. And so when you have these kind of low-key sort of vacation, get together meetups that aren't really a car show, it becomes family friendly and it becomes a place where you don't mind bringing your boys or, you know, my daughter and let them look at some cool cars and see this real cool stuff. And uh, it's too bad that (laughs) shit turns into such a disaster. You know, I think, uh, I, the problem is I think realistically to do a show, you need controlled chaos. Um, which means you need to harness that, that uh, I don't know what you would I don't know how I would describe it, but the, you know, like for example, bureaucracy. They have drag racing, but they also have a burnout pit 
that they have. And I don't, uh, I don't, you know, it's, it seems like an outlet for people to, to do stupid shit and kind of get out of their system and not have to do it outside of whatever the controls of what's happening that's safe or reasonable. Well, let's, let's just call it, call it like it is. I mean, when you, when you have a car show, it is primarily a male dominated arena and dudes seem to have this need to always have a dick measuring contest. And so drag race, awesome. Your car's faster. So your dick's bigger burnout contest. You ruined your tires more than this other guy. He's got a really small wiener. Uh, you, you know, you, you give them the sanctioned spot. All right, Johnny, go do your burnout over here and let Steve and his family like have a hot dog and see some cool cars. Right. And you, you need something t- to where the boys can hit, measure their dicks with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that doesn't get in the way of like a really enjoyable experience for the people that don't feel they need to set measure said dicks. It sounds like it sounds like I said dick of, measuring a lot. So you did. It yeah. sounds like we were talking about some sort of sword fight situation. Well, that I, <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think um, you do have to get that out there somewhere in the ether. Otherwise, it will happen. Yeah, I think you see that a little bit, like at Black Forest show, and and I'm I'm definitely not like trying to pick on one show or another, point out who's great and who sucks. Uh, I really don't care. Um, I think they do a pretty good job for a show that's sizable Mm -hmm. in a pretty small space. And has alcohol. Especially that has alcohol, Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is both one of the biggest attractors because a lot of people like to drink beer Mm -hmm. and walk around and look at cars. Uh, You know, clearly that can be that can be a big negative, but they do have. They do a good job of having the car show, having a couple of things for people to do, and then people get a little squirrely leaving the place. But I think all in all, people are... It's not the worst, yeah. Reasonably, like, get a little silly. Don't be too stupid, but have some fun when you roll out the door. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I think that's true. But I wonder when you get into that. I mean, you talk about what, what works. I mean, I think really the model of Wookiees or Helen, because see, here's the problem is the destination is the show. Yeah, it totally is. It totally is. And I I don't think I felt that way. And I've only been to Waterfest once uh, at the dragway before it was uh, at the other location. And that is not a destination I want to go to. It's a big Um, fucking parking lot. You might as well be in a mall. I, yeah. And except it's 8,000 degrees and yeah. I passed 75 Dunkin' Donuts on the way there. <laughs> Weirdest <laughs> thing. Yeah. There's a lot. And the Northeast has a lot of Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. The, I, I mean, whatever. I'm not hating on donuts, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people can justify that for, you know, you, you kind of have this split you have, I'm going to travel to a show unless you have built like a proper show car. I'm going to travel to this show. I'm going to go to Helen. I'm going to go to Fontana. I'm going to have a great weekend, a couple of days, hanging out with my friends, seeing some cool cars. Or you have the really hyper-local cars and coffee kind of stuff, which that, I think, I think those kind of cars and coffee, really hyper-local, uh, that, that's not going anywhere. But I just think of these shows like uh, Soho or uh, Euro experience in Helen, uh, not Helen, Savannah. And like the attraction to that kind of stuff, unless, unless you are a hardcore car show person, whether you have a show car or not, is just not there. It's yeah. like, I, I don't want to stand around in a parking lot all day looking at the same 75 cars. I I agree, and and frankly, the cost to do a build that's that's significant enough to attract enough attention is so uh, it's outrageous. Obviously, you and I know that because we have we've built different cars, and you know I've never done anything particularly special to be honest with you. But um, you can look at just the cost of that stuff relative to other stuff and people tend to be more interested in things that even have content around it like for example the all track stuff or or your cars or whatever just because they know the the a little bit of the story to it um and that's uh, you look at a car show 
even the most amazing show car, you're missing kind of the legend and the history of this thing. So you don't have real appreciation for it, right? Yeah. There's no context. There's no story behind mm-hmm. it. And that's one reason why I think in, in a lot of ways, following some of these builds online actually becomes even more fulfilling um, for a couple of reasons. One, you do get that story and you start to relate to that person that's building it. And, you know, either you, you see and feel the struggle that they're going through when they post that YouTube video, or you feel the victory of like, finally got this part to fit. Yay. When you see that car in person though, uh, at least for me anyway, the, the shine is not there. The Instagram filter is not there anymore. So you have peeled back the layer and you see all the uncut zip ties mm-hmm. and yeah. that connector that's not a connector. It's just a couple of wires twisted together and tucked <laughs> away. Uh, and, and, a wire and, nut. I, yeah. I mean, these are, these are like, I've seen these things at SEMA. Uh, so, you know, when you see it on that stage to see it at a local car show shouldn't be, shouldn't be any of a surprise. So, you know, how, how many layers do you want to peel back before you're like, wow, super disappointed in this build i thought it was awesome and it sucks yeah well i mean sema is a, di- a whole different ball of wax because for anybody who doesn't has never been to sema they don't realize you know how many of these cars get built with these insane timelines and these they're overly ambitious expectations of what they're trying to accomplish and it's just you know it's so over the top that these are you know people don't realize these are 150, 200, 300, 400,000 dollar builds that people are doing on these fucking cars and half of them don't even run and drive when they get to SEMA. Yeah, or at least the uh the front wheels on your big truck turn the Bluetooth the, drive shaft, yeah. Not the Bluetooth drive shaft <laughs> <laughs> of your bro dozer. I was I couldn't think of the word cuz I haven't had to think of the word in so long. It's it's the Bluetooth drive shaft in your bro dozer. Yeah. So I, I do think, though, we're going to see these shows come back. And I think, you know, over the next year or so, they'll do pretty well because people miss it and they, they, they need that outlet. Or they've been working on their car and haven't gotten to show it in a year and a half or whatever. So I think we'll see over the next year um, a lot of that come back and do really, really well. I think there's some shows that are planned for this fall that I'm not really expecting them to happen especially not in the capacity that some of the promoters are thinking uh, we'll see. I mean, obviously for the sake of the world getting back to normal, I, w- I would love for that to happen, but I just, I, it, some of them are too close to whatever the date of today is to, uh, to really happen at, at any kind of scale. There's a local cars and coffee that happened this past weekend. And I don't know, maybe 30 cars, maybe 40 cars were there, most of them Mustangs. I don't think anyone in the crowd got hit, <laughs> at least not that I know of. And um, I live in a pretty small town, so like 40 cars in a parking lot fills like one of the two biggest parking lots in the town. But apparently the police had chief like had a problem with it and you're supposed to get a permit and they're not issuing permits and whatnot, but um, there was a point to that ramble. But uh you know, anything bigger than that, I, and even that's problematic, but anything bigger than that, I just, I don't see happening until, honestly, until next year. What would be the first thing that you would go to? The first show that I would go to. So if smash the button and uh, the world returned to normal, I would probably go to SEMA just because it's a thing to do uh, kind of in the industry that we're in. Um, also there, you know, I, I talk a lot of shit about SEMA and some of the builds. There's some amazing cars. Oh, oh God. That's at amazing. SEMA. And like, yeah. you'll never see these things anywhere else except online. Um, but you'll probably never see most of these in person. So there's some amazing stuff. So I probably would do SEMA beyond that. I mean, I, I don't, there's the show in Florida. Uh, is it Euro tripper? Maybe Euro tripper. Yeah. I'm, I might consider that. Um, but I think that's November, I think that was February. Oh, maybe I think it's a fix fest. I don't I don't know. Know. There's a show in Florida that's around yeah. in early February that I'd probably go to, uh, cause the guys that do that do, uh, did Alpine Volksfair. And I thought they did a pretty good job, especially for a, um, a maiden show, maiden voyage on the show. Other than that, dude, I'm holding out to Wookiees. I mean, I, I, 
it's not a perfect show, but I think top to bottom, it is that, like you mentioned, Paul, destination, vacation, car show, community, family, uh, the raffle's awesome, and you can win some awesome prizes, even though I've never won anything, uh, which I'm like a little salty about, but whatever. Uh, all the people that win put a lot of money in that raffle, so I'm not, I'm not hating on it too bad. Beyond that, you know, then, so we move into that. We move into uh, uh, the other one in Helen again, Volksfair. I probably would hit that because uh, I'm curious about it. I got invited this past year to Import Alliance at Atlanta, Atlanta. Speedway. Yeah. Um, I would probably do that uh, a lot of out of curiosity and to see what that show's about. I've never been to like that level of a a show like that anyway. Uh, so I would probably do that. Although I don't love big crowds, but I would go to SEMA. That doesn't make any sense. Does it? It's, what different about di- it's a very, first of all, it's a very different dynamic, uh, SEMA for you or I than anywhere else. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I think the, I can't see myself going to SEMA at this point. I mean, I've said for about four years now, like, Oh, I'm not going to SEMA this year. Don't need to. And then every year I go. So I've, as of a couple of years ago, I, I just decided I'm going to SEMA every year just because I'm tired of changing my plans last minute. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But I, I legitimately cannot see myself going to SEMA this year. I mean, I can't, there's no, there's no realm that it makes any sense for me to go to SEMA because I don't, I don't have to be there. And because I don't have to be there, you know, with all the stuff going on, why would I? Yeah. I, I have said, you know, the last SEMA conversation I had like with a a company like legit serious conversation was probably two months ago. And two months ago I was, I was still pretty much, I'm going to SEMA unless there's some crazy compelling reason not to. And today, kind of like you, I've basically shifted that unless there is a very compelling reason for me to go, I'm not going to go even to the point where if a vendor called and said, Hey, we want your yellow car in our booth at SEMA. That would probably be one of the few things that would get me to do it. Um, is that is this is this like a low key pitch happening right now? Yeah. So if anybody out there wants a <laughs> bright yellow 2019 Golf R uh, Expel, <laughs> they had a McLaren in their booth last year, so I don't think they want to trudge through the gutter for my golf. I don't um, know. You know, it's funny about that. I think uh, oftentimes at SEMA, regular cars end up getting more eyes because it's not just a, the 900th supercar you've seen today. Like that VR6 swap. Uh, was it HPA Beetle? Um, well, that was, that was a pretty badass prime car location too, uh, in, in kind of one of the main, more main thoroughfares, but yeah, short of that, or like an incredibly profitable opportunity, I don't see myself going. And of course this wouldn't happen to be one of the years where SEMA falls on Halloween, uh, anyway. So I don't have that excuse, but yeah, I, I, I've seen a lot of emails from SEMA talking about some of the protocols that they're changing and. The show's a go. It's definitely happening. I'm surprised even now that with everything being canceled, that they're still so gung ho about it. I think it's good in a lot of ways, but I don't think I can afford not to un- unless there's Too much money, unless there's a lot of money thrown in my lap to go. I mean, just to be frank, uh, I don't, I don't foresee going. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I wonder if if the local scene intends to um, create more opportunity. I wonder, you know, interesting uh, and interestingly enough, we talked about our we did our or we talked we never did one of our events that we talked about, um, but it was kind of a it was piggybacking off the other events, but it was kind of a similar cruise event, almost like what we're thinking of of being the appeal, which would be more of a you could take that and pull it up and put it anywhere and it would it would stand alone as a fine thing to do um i wonder if that type of thing becomes the model of what happens for most car shows that just they just turn into like um 
accrues a rally of some kind that gets, you know, 20 to 50 people together and they go do something interesting and, you know, whatever. And, and then that's what car enthusiasts generally tends to happen. Um, I don't know. I, don't, I think, I, I also think with the advent of YouTube, uh, it draws people to events, you know, like you see a car that you've watched the build of for the whole time. And then you get the opportunity to go see it in person and then potentially talk to the people who built it in person. Maybe I think it draws a certain type of person out, not you and I, cause that's not who we are and that's not how we operate. But I think there is a place for those people that they exist and they want to, they want to have those interactions. Yeah, I I think that number's low, um, but there are definitely those people that are like, oh, you know, so-and-so show, well, this guy's going to be there with this car that he built, and that's really cool. You know, I'm thinking of Import Alliance, and Honda Pro Jason's built this ridiculous Civic Type R that I think he had like four miles on it before the whole car got stripped out, and he, he had it completely repainted. Um, you know, $40,000 car or whatever, and the, the roof's off, and it's got a carbon fiber roof and, and whatnot. If there were a show, now I'm pretty lazy uh, with this kind of stuff. So if it was within like 30 minutes, I say that I'm kidding. If it was within like two hours, I'd probably go see it. Uh, so I guess there is there is that component too. Uh, but even then, that's like you go, you see the car, you spend a half an hour, and you leave, and that's it. That's now what? The, right. That's the day. The now what is the problem? Exactly. That- that honestly, that's what the future I think of anybody, anybody out there who's listening, who may be a car show promoter, that's the problem to solve is the now what, because too long people have been standing with their fucking hands in their pockets, um, with nothing to do. And that's, what's created the dynamic of people not caring about car shows is because why spend eight hours driving to spend two hours looking at stuff to then spend the next you know, 36 hours doing nothing, essentially <laughs> Unless eating you're mediocre in, fucking oh. waffle house food and shit, you know, like dude, uh, waffle house is the pinnacle compared to most of that terrible crap that comes through those events. It's like the bottom gutter fair food, uh, that, that you can possibly get. The only exceptions I really feel like are the shows that have lucrative and winnable trophies and prizes for, maybe not the person that is going to spend $50,000 on their GTI build. Um, but maybe the person that has like a pretty cool car that they've done a little bit of work to that isn't, you know, I say bags and wheels, just kind of poking fun at the, I have a build, I put bags and wheels on it. It's not group think. It's not the same as everything else. It's different. It's not click buy from a website order and get delivered to your house and bolt these four parts on it's something unique and cool and they've got the little touches that they've done or you know they've uh, in our community they've uh, imported something from europe or australia or whatever that we can't get here and stuff like that i think is real cool um so i think if you have that component where someone that doesn't just throw money at their car can actually get recognized and maybe even win a trophy or a prize I think there's a lot of appeal to that. Short of that, man, like you, you got to spend a lot of money to get any kind of recognition in the automotive industry, right? And in, in, in the car world, a lot, a lot. of money, <laughs> not $10,000 a lot, like $80,000 a lot. Yeah. Um, that's one of like the cool things about YouTube and, and some of these social platforms is that some of these smaller builds that are doing those really cool, unique things can actually get that recognition that, uh, you know, that, that they may, may or may not deserve. But if you could put that together where normal-ish cars can get a recognition, you can have the, and now what, problem solved, I feel like you got a pretty big hit of a show. And, you know, I, I, I don't think you're ever going to get rich just doing low-level small car shows. But at least it's going to be profitable. And as we've talked a million times before, if you're not making money at these kind of things, how vested are you and how, what's the longevity of you actually be able to being, being able to produce a good quality event for people to go to? Well, yeah, I mean, you know my opinion. And, and that's, 
very much that if if somebody's not making money off the car show, it's almost certainly not going to be the best, and it's certainly not going to last very long because the amount of time and effort that people that you have to put into to legitimately put on a, a, a you know, and that's you know that's a testament to obviously Abe and a lot of people involved in Wookies is these guys don't make shit and they're they're out here donating everything to um to charity for for what the show turns you know the stamina they've had with putting on this event given all the bullshit that they have to deal with according to it related to it um and you know uh, you know obviously uh, any show of any reasonable size is full of any number of fucking assholes who have have been absurd, treated them badly, whatever, who they then have to deal with in, in a diplomatic way. Uh, and while all, while not getting anything for it, essentially. Yeah. I think, I think those guys are, are far and away the exception and uh, you know, and, and do deserve all the credit in the world, but that is, that is definitely the exception and way outside the norm. Mm, yeah. Most, most promoters are not going to make any money. They're going to do it for a couple of years and go, F this, this sucks. This is too much work. Uh, I'm going to either pass this along to someone else, you know, big, bigger level thing or whatever, or just done. We're out. Right. That's, that would be why shows tend to decline or seemingly nobody gives a shit about them anymore is because the person who was doing it for so long, who didn't make money off of it for long enough, they just said, you know, my life, I, they, maybe they have kids, maybe they have whatever, maybe they're just sick of it, but they move on, you know, they move on to something else because any, as anything that's a passion, you may move on to something different. And if, if it doesn't, uh, benefit you financially, eventually, almost no matter what, you're going to walk away from it. Well, you can only get kicked in the dick in that space so many times before you're like, this shit ain't worth it anymore. I'm out. And, uh, I, I, I'm not saying I would be any different. I think, I think I would either be making money or quit and, uh, you know, within reason, of course, but yeah, I, I props to Abe is all I can say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and Kinda obviously things, of course. our event was a whole different thing. Cause that was like a little thing we were putting on. It required a little bit of planning, a little bit of effort on our end. Um, but not serious commitment like those type of things that those shows are something different that where they're, they're meeting with, you know, boards and people from the town and all kinds of shit for, you know, eight months ahead of time. And like, you know, we just drove around some fucking roads. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of level of commitment. Is we just drove around some roads yeah. and wrote some stuff. Yeah. Down. And we had dinner and drinks at night and shit. That was, that was, we're not talking about a serious commitment here. Yeah. You um, can count me in for all that every single time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been more committed to a uh, to a pair of socks than I have to that particular <laughs> particular thing. Yeah, well, we got what we put into it, I guess. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's anyway. true. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. No, that's that's coronavirus's fault. That's not our fault. Nope, uh, nope, nope, uh, nope. That one bummed the, me out. That might be one of my biggest bummers of uh, of all this bullshit of 2020. You think so? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was. Know. I was looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, we'll see. So. Uh, so long-term prediction, what happens with car shows? I, I think unless someone can really crack the code of stuff to do or a destination to go to, or ideally both, <clears throat> we continue to see this decline to where you're really going to have like one, maybe two good shows regionally. Uh, and then you know, you probably always have your, your classics and then there's like the next level stuff, uh, for the, the high end stuff. But I think, I think where the magic is going to be, if you can't crack the code of what comes next and, um, and the destination is just your local small cars and coffee. And as long as people aren't acting like fools, um, I think you could be good there. Short of that, I don't think we're going to see a huge resurgence at, at any kind of scale for any length of time. Um, because the other side of this too is more people aren't getting interested in cars, right? I think that's a declining trend just across the board, take the show out of it. 
there are less people today that are enthusiastic about cars than there were 25 years ago. Um, so that plays a role in it too. And, and you have all the numbers coming down and down and down. So solve the problem promoters, give us something to do. We get bored fast. Yeah. Dance monkey. <laughs> I paid no dollars for this. I expect something to do. <laughs> I have high expectations. Damn it. Uh, yeah, well, that's, uh, the future in car shows for all of you. Uh, uh, all these rays of sunshine that we're trying yeah. down to find everyone. Wow. So if you're not super depressed after this, yeah. uh, I don't know what to tell you. If What's you haven't started again? drinking yet, now is the time. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. Stop at the ABC store on the way home. Just don't don't drink and drive, of course. Yes, seriously. Okay. Well, on that note, I think uh, <laughs> we'll we'll <laughs> reconvene next week where we hopefully bring on a topic that somebody will actually create a smile of on someone's face uh and uh we'll also kick your dog while we're at it so until next episode <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs>